Hi, this is Adam Green, the director of Hatchet, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. My name's Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode 57 for Friday, June 1st, 2012. Well, today I have an interview with horror icon, writer, producer, director, and actor, Adam Green. And you might know Adam from, wow, a whole pile of movies, including Hatchet, Spiral, Frozen, Grace, and also the new Fearnet series, Holliston. Well, um, it's, it's an amazing video interview. It's a pretty long one, so we're going to roll right with that interview in a second. Just a reminder to go to tvwriterpodcast.com for back episodes, for a database of TV writers on Twitter that's over 900 writers and continues to climb, and also lots of links to free scripts and other cool stuff. But right now, my interview with Adam Green, Him, his address on Twitter is Adam underscore FN underscore Green. So give him a follow. I'm on Twitter, too. At Gray Jones is my handle. Here we go. Enjoy. This is Gray, and I'm here with writer, producer, director, and actor Adam Green. How are you doing, Adam? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. And I really appreciate you coming on. I know that you had a late night last night, and you're in the thick of things producing hatchet three um, yes. which is incredibly exciting yes exciting but very very hard yeah yeah wow and, and we will get to that in uh, in a little bit i mean producing a franchise really is uh, such a such an amazing thing and you're not that old either so that's pretty cool but um uh why don't we go way way back uh, you grew up in holliston which is a very familiar word um, yep. Tell me about growing up in Holliston and when you got the film bug. Well, um, Holliston is a little suburb in Massachusetts. It's about 45 minutes outside of Boston, which mm -hmm. if you're not from Massachusetts, Boston is like the only thing that most people know <laughs> about Massachusetts. But it was a very small, quaint town um, with like cows and chickens and like a couple of farms. And it was a great place to grow up. I had a wonderful childhood with great friends and great people. Um, lower middle class, I think, is what Holliston probably qualifies for. And... I first got bit with the film bug when I was eight years old. Um, I remember walking out of E.T. Mm. and just, um, you know, I was already a huge movie fan. And I think I think almost everybody is a movie fan to yeah. some degree. But I was uncontrollably crying. And I remember that night trying to figure it out because I knew E.T. wasn't real. I knew it was just a movie. He didn't even look real. Yeah. But something about it, like, I just it just destroyed me. And from that point on, I wanted to know, like, how do you write? How do you direct? Like, how does music factor into this? How, like, how do you do this? And just really studying it. And from that point on, even playing with my Star Wars toys, I was always playing with them and like watching the, like the angles for how I was seeing them <laughs> and how I was looking at them. And then it just takes over your whole life as I think any filmmaker will say. And, you know, aspiring filmmakers will ask me all the time for advice and usually my first question to them is, well, what's your backup? And if they have one, if they're like, well, if this doesn't work out, I'd like to do whatever. I'm like, well, then do that. Mm. If you, you should only do this if it is this or death, because it's, it is not easy and it's not fair. And there's so many great people that it is not going to work out for. And I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm just saying if you have something else in mind, do that because that that will you have a better chance of that happening. Mm. Now, if this is it, then go for it and go for it with all that you have. Um, that's what I did. I think that's probably what everybody did who's had any success at it. But um, grab a helmet because it it's hard. Well, I mean, looking at, you, at your bio and your track record so far, I get the impression that that has been kind of a motto. I mean, you have just gone for it hook line and sinker um but tell me a little like, let's slow down a little bit tell me a little bit about going to university you went to hofstra university in new york yes uh hofstra um it's a great liberal arts 
college uh, in Hempstead, New York, on Long Island. My older brother had gone there, mm -hmm. and I knew that they had a really good communication school. I didn't want to start looking at all these other schools. Um, I knew I didn't want to go out west yet um, for a number of reasons, mainly that my family was on the East Coast, and I wasn't ready to be that far away from them. And uh, a girlfriend that I had, my childhood sweetheart, who I'd been with my whole life, who was also going to college on the East Coast mm -hmm. at Villanova in Pennsylvania. Um, she's actually the girl uh, that Holliston, the TV show, is about. Um, but uh, I looked at you know Syracuse, which was a great school, but too far from New York City to really get any, any meaningful internships. Mm -hmm. And then there was Emerson in Boston, which was a little too artsy for me. So Hofstra just seemed great. And I went there for four years. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in TV and film. So Bachelor of Science is a little different from Bachelor of Arts. And yeah, that that's it, interesting. Yeah, it's just it's just more concentrated and mm -hmm. you have to be a little bit more psycho. It's a lot of physics of light and sound and really understanding the technical side of television and film production. So not that many people choose Bachelor of Science because – you also have to take classes on winter sessions and summer sessions, and it, it just adds a lot to your workload. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of always been the guy that I am, unfortunately. Like, <laughs> if there's an extra class to be taken, I will take it. If there's an extra step, an extra mile to go, I will do it. Um, I don't think that had anything to do with my career, which I know Hofstra hates every time I say that. But um, nobody's ever asked me where I went to school, what my GPA was, which mm -hmm. I had a I was on Dean's list every year. I worked my ass off in college. Um, and I think it helped me, you know, keep defining my work ethic. And I, I'm sure I learned something along the way, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I started making my own stuff and really got out to LA and meeting people and working on all kinds of different things. That's where you really learn. Like in college, they can't teach you how to get an agent or how to get an independent film finance. Mm -hmm. um, they, they can't, nobody can teach you that. You just have to figure it out. Yeah. And and so that was evidence that you got a job after college at a at a local cable company? Yes. Uh Time Time Warner Cable in Malden, Massachusetts. Um I moved home to Massachusetts right when I graduated mm -hmm. and Malden is a little city right outside of Boston. And um it was a great job. I had interned there one summer when I was in college and it was making like, you know, if you're watching a cable channel like MTV or ESPN late at night and there's mm -hmm. that one commercial that comes on that is so bad for some <laughs> local business and you're just like, who made this? Like, that was me. Wow. <laughs> That's what I was doing. And there's an art to that whole thing. Like, they want the commercials to look really cheap and silly really? and stupid because it makes the customer think that their prices are lower. When in reality, uh... you're usually better off going to a big chain because the independent place has to jack the prices. So uh -huh. there's an art to the whole thing um, that a lot of people probably never would have thought of. But what I loved about that job was that I could borrow Time Warner Cable's equipment and make my own things with it mm. because – I had no money. Like when I say I was broke, I mean, I was so, so broke. Mm. And, um, but there I was with a beta, beta SP camera, which now nobody would wow. ever use. Um, and it was, uh, and, and I had three lights, three airy lights, and I had some editing equipment. It was, it was tape to tape because this was before Avid. Um, but, but I could make stuff. And that's where also where I met Will Barrett, who has been my director of photography and my partner in my company, Ariesco Pictures, for 13 years now, actually 14 years this year. Mm -hmm. um, and we made a short film called Columbus Day Weekend, where Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers stalked the same campsite by mistake. And <sighs> we just made it for fun to show at a Halloween party. We spent $8 on it. We just shot it in one night. And that short ended up getting passed around and passed around. And eventually, I got an email from a guy who worked at a talent agency in Hollywood saying, mm -hmm. um, Everybody's laughing at your short film. You should come out here and meet with these agents. And I'm thinking like, oh, I made it. Um, and I wish I could say it was that easy, but it wasn't. When, wow. I, when I did eventually come out to Hollywood, nobody actually met with me. Nobody gave anything about my short. Um, at that point, they had already moved on to a short film called The Spirit of Christmas mm -hmm. with a bunch of cardboard cutouts of little kids that swear at each other. And I was like, this is never going to work. And that, of course, became South Park. So what do I know? Wow. Um, but then it was, uh, it was three years of struggle in LA and nothing was working out. And I was a I was the DJ at a place called the Rainbow Bar and Grill on the mm -hmm. Sunset Strip. It's a heavy metal hangout. And literally was eating leftover food off of other people's plates at the end of the night just to survive. 
and um, lots of odd jobs, assistant jobs, PA jobs. And then finally, um, a movie that I had made right before I left Boston called Coffee and Donuts, which was a feature that we made for only $400. Um, it won a film festival. And then all of a sudden I had interest. Mm. And then it was still a few more years before anything happened with that. But eventually we were able to resell it as a sitcom. And it was we sold it to UPN, which was the sort of minority network, which how a story about my life fit on the minority network, I'm never going to understand. And that's probably why it never got shot. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, that was the year that UPN decided to merge with the WB. So all development got lost and nothing ever happened with it. And mm. they held the rights to my story, which was my life story oh, no. for five years. Um, but in that process of developing Coffee and Donuts, I wrote a movie called Hatchet, which I had been dreaming up since I was eight years old at summer camp. Mm -hmm. And when I first wrote that script... You must have been interesting at eight years old. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the camp... The camp that I went to, the counselors wanted to send me home. Like people thought I was very weird because I, uh -huh. I loved horror movies. I and it all really stems from loving the holiday of Halloween and mm -hmm. not seeing it to end. And so, um, yeah, well, I I made um, I, I I made I, I made Hatchet, even though nobody said that that would work. My my agents at the time, these like Hollywood douchebags, they were like, "This movie is not going to get made. Like, it's just not going to happen. Like, this is like a '80s slasher. Like, that's dead. Like, why don't you do a remake? You should do a remake of something." And I'm like, mm -hmm. "I don't, I don't want to do a remake." And they sent it out to the studios, and one of the studios that will remain nameless, their rejection letter said. The writing for the script is brilliant. However, this movie will never get made because it's not a remake, it's not a sequel, and it's not based on a Japanese one. Uh. So I made that the tagline for the movie. So if anybody saw Hatchet when it was doing the festival tour for a year and a half, the tagline on the poster said it's not a remake, it's not a sequel, and it's not based on a Japanese one. <laughs> Which I got to thank that studio for giving me gold because that sort of became the battle cry for that movie where it was this uh -huh. like – old school slasher movie with practical effects and it wasn't a remake and it wasn't PG 13 and it, it, you know, um, and it just sort of struck a chord and became almost like a drum beat where all these like serious horror fanatics just took interest in it and would come out of the woodwork and every festival we would do hatchet would sell out and get standing ovations and win awards and great reviews. And I never expected that because that was a, it's a very selfish movie. It was just mm -hmm. the type of movie that I wanted to see again. I didn't realize that there were other people that felt the same way I did that would even appreciate seeing a movie like that again. Wow. Um, but lo and behold, uh, here I am now in Louisiana uh, about to start shooting Hatchet 3. So uh, it worked. Wow. Wow. And, and I mean, it really went viral, it seems. Like there's, there's a very loyal following now. But um, there was a, a, something that happened with Hatchet Two, um, tell me a little bit about uh, there was some ratings fiasco. Yeah, um, well, that actually started with Hatchet One. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was with Hatchet One, we finally ended up getting a theatrical release for that movie, which was so exciting because so few movies get the chance to play in theaters now. Everything goes right to on demand and iTunes and DVD. Um, but Anchor Bay, the distributor really believed in that film and it was actually like the first, their first honest shot at doing a theatrical release. And then we had to go before the MPAA and I wasn't worried at all because at that time we had torture porn and movies that were so vicious and sickening and mean spirited. And I know that they were under a lot of fire for those movies. So I felt like I was going to have a cakewalk because Hatchet's so silly and goofy and funny mm -hmm. And there's nothing realistic in it. And then lo and behold, they came back with an NC-17. And you can't play your movie in mainstream theaters if you have that rating. You can't advertise it. You can't put it in newspapers. It's basically saying that your movie's pornographic. Wow. So, and this is an age-old like debate that everybody goes through. But normally, what you do is you just keep censoring and editing your movie until they finally accept it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that's what I did. And Eventually, it hit a point where they had changed the movie so much that I didn't even recognize it anymore. Because the whole point of Hatchet is that it's so ridiculous and over the top. So instead mm -hmm. of like tearing off somebody's arm and it realistically bleeding, we have blood shooting 40 feet in the air. Like, <laughs> like, 
<laughs> and they were taking all that out. And so wow. I said, what are my other options? And they said, well, you can appeal. And I said, great, let me do that. And they were like, are you serious? You really want to appeal? And I'm like, yeah, I want to appeal. Now I know better. You never appeal oh, because no. all it does is make you a marked man for the rest of your life. And they will just keep coming after you for challenging them. But when you do an appeal with the MPAA, what happens is they screen the movie for 12 people that are industry professionals, which means theater owners and operators, other filmmakers, studio execs, um, but not people involved with the ratings board. Mm. But you have no way of knowing who's involved with the ratings board because they stay anonymous. They won't tell you their names. They hide. Even when you drop off your movie, you have to put it through this little slot where you just see these two little eyes come out. <laughs> like, but, but no, really, they're an honest and up and up, you know, organization, really. Um, uh -huh. And so I appealed. And so I went and they screened Hatchet and they walked in 12 senior citizens who they had to have found no. off the screen. One of them was in a walker. And I'm just like, what? Like, are you kidding me? And so the woman said, uh, the movie you're going to be screening today that's an arbitration is called Hatchet. And the whole theater groans. They all go, ugh. And I'm like, oh, oh this, is, this is fair. So I had seen that movie all over the world in every country with people that speak every different language. And there are certain jokes in that movie that everybody laughed at every time, no matter what. Uh -huh. They didn't laugh at a single thing. They were uh -huh. turning away whenever there was violence. And so I knew I was in trouble. Um, and then Joan Graves, who was the head of the MPAA, she gets up to speak. And the whole time they're telling you, you're not supposed to talk about this publicly. Like this conversation we're having right now, I am not ever supposed to do this. Uh -huh. um, but again, they're a very fair and, and proper organization. Um, and I basically made my case that right now we have a thing called torture porn where horror has become about how disturbing it can be and how realistic it can be. And when I was a kid, I didn't get into this because I wanted to watch people suffer and cry and scream for their lives. I liked seeing monsters and unstoppable villains and fantastical violence that could never possibly happen in real life. And that's why it was mm -hmm. fun for me. And that's what I tried to bring back. And um, then Joan got up and basically said that I was the scum of the earth and my movie was the most depraved and disgusting thing and it was just violence for violence sake i mean just completely destroyed me oh, and i got a rebuttal in which i said you know two weeks ago i went to see a movie called the hills have eyes which was a remake and in that movie there was a scene where and i'm not condemning that movie i like that movie and i think all horror has a place whether it's something like human centipede in a serbian film or something kind of fun like hatchet Everything has its place and everything has its fan base, whether it's for me or not. It has the right to exist as long as it's made with um, w with some re respect and just some, I don't know, you got to be responsible when you mm. make these things. And there are filmmakers out there that aren't. They just think, oh, I could do this. I'll make the most disgusting thing ever. But you got to be responsible for that. You got to think of the people that are seeing that. You got to live with yourself. That's why you don't see rape in my movies or animal violence or anything like that. My movies are very tame compared to other ones. And I said, in this movie, there's a scene where they rape a woman in front of her like four month old baby. Then they suck on the mother's breast until she lactates in the villain's mouth, bite the head off the family parakeet and drink the blood, shoot the mother in the head in front of the baby. Meanwhile, dad is outside crucified and burning to death. And then they run off into the night with this baby that they're going to eat. Nobody in that theater was laughing. Yet, they're going to condemn me for having an undead swamp monster with a gas-powered belt sander chase a bunch of comedians and kill them like Monty Python. And not a single person in that appeal would even look at me. Nobody would make eye contact. And that's when I realized this whole thing was a sham. I'm set up. Wow. They're, these are all people they know that come in to say no, because what if, what if I had won? The yeah. appeal? Nobody wins an appeal and that's why, like, cause then everybody would question them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the rating stood NC 17. I had to keep censoring the film and on opening night when I should have been celebrating and being so excited that my first movie made it to theaters, I'm watching this movie that I don't even recognize and all the good stuff is cut out and the audience they liked it, but I, I could hear people afterwards. They're like, I've been reading about this for years. It's won all these awards. What was the big deal? Like, I what was so great about these effects? They didn't see the effects. Um, so with Hatchet 2, which was made five years later, 
I needed a break after Hatchet. I had other opportunities I wanted to pursue. I wanted other styles of movies to make, like Spiral and Grace and Frozen. Mm -hmm. But I was ready to to go back, get the same crew back together, and make Hatchet 2, which conceptually had been planned before we made Hatchet 1. We mm -hmm. just didn't know what was going to happen with Hatchet 1. And um, this time, I, I just didn't hold back. I totally went for it. If I wanted to strangle somebody with their own intestines and pop their head off, I was going to do it. Um, cut not just cut one guy in half with a chainsaw, let's cut two guys in half at the same time. I mean, it was so, <laughs> so out there and ridiculous. And I thought we were going to video and on demand because the first one wasn't this huge box office hit, huge mm -hmm. hit on DVD around the world and in theaters in some countries, but not in the US. And when we were done, Dark Sky, the distributor, viewed the movie and they were like, this is fantastic. We should play this in theaters. And I was like, oh, God, here we go. <laughs> and um, But they said, but wait, um, we have a contact at AMC Theaters who is a huge Hatchet fan and who loved the movie. And really? they said that they might be willing to show it unrated. And now I was like, whoa, everything's turning around. Like, it's all coming up green. Uh -oh. um, they were going to play the movie unrated in their mainstream multiplexes, which hadn't happened in America in almost 30 years. It was like a groundbreaking, history-making, awesome thing. Wow. And I was so excited. And so, of course, that was the angle. When they made the trailer for the movie, which, you know, I don't have everything to do with that stuff. The posters, mm -hmm. the trailers, it kind of, it's out of my hands at that point. The whole trailer was more gore than you've ever seen, unrated, oh, no. uncut. And then that's when all the press came running. Like, what do you mean you're unrated? You didn't get an MPA rating? Like, this is this is a landmark film. This is huge. And other people at AMC, higher up, who I'll never know, suits, since I mean, it's a huge corporation, started to get a little worried because there was all this attention. Hmm. And then we were told, myself, the cast, this is about three weeks before the movie opened, that we are not allowed to talk about the fact that the movie's unrated anymore. Don't talk about it. Don't say the words MPAA, nothing. And that was already the selling point of the movie. So we did the best we could. There was a publicist on the phone at all times. And as wow, soon as wow. the journalist would bring it up, the publicist would step in and say, they're not talking about that, which, you know, that went over great. <laughs> and, um, and then the movie opened and sorry, the day before the movie opened, Entertainment Weekly ran an interview they had done with me months before about my experience with the MPAA. Hmm. And their headline that they went with was Adam Green calls the MPAA evil. Oh. So you can only imagine how happy the people were at AMC when they saw this. And um, they're like, what did we tell you? And I'm like, I did this interview three months ago. I don't like I can't control when they're going to do this. And by the way, they are evil. <laughs> um, and uh, the movie opened. And by the next morning, we were hearing from people in Canada that the movie was gone already. It literally played once on Thursday night at midnight and it was gone. In America, it was dwindling really fast. Kept hearing from people that they had just gone to their uh, local theater. They weren't carrying the movie anymore. In LA, when I went, the movie was, it was, it was pretty packed. We had a midnight screening that I went to and I went to the next night screening. But they carded you when you bought your ticket. They carded you when you they ripped your ticket and then there was a guard at the door because all these people who weren't 17 were buying tickets to other movies and then trying to run in to see hatchet too mm -hmm. so we're never going to know how the movie actually did because they released the per screen average on sunday where they said it had done a thousand dollars per screen which is still good and i mean we're on 68 screens with no marketing like i'll mm -hmm. take that um, but it's a program called AMC Independent, which means you're going to need word of mouth because these are movies that don't have a marketing budget that are going to need a few weeks in the theater for people to talk about them. Yeah, so you look yeah. at the second weekend and see, did it go up? Um, well, uh, they said $1,000 per screen, but how do you figure that out? It was on 68 screens, but it didn't play all weekend on 68 screens. It was down to 24 screens by Saturday night. Some theaters wow. only played it once a day. So the, the whole thing was such a farce. And then it's gone on Sunday night, completely gone. And uh, like, I'm trying to think like the Hollywood Reporter, all these people kind of went after AMC saying what happened to Hatchet 2. And they said, well, we base our decisions financially. This movie wasn't performing like we had hoped, so we pulled it. Now, in the history of time, no movie has ever been pulled within 48 hours for not performing well. Wow. Um, and 
the other thing that the Hollywood Reporter, I think it was the Hollywood Reporter, maybe it was Cinematical, called them on was, well, another movie opened this weekend, another genre movie called Chain Letter. And that made $342 per screen. And it's a disaster of a mm-hmm. bomb. Hatchet 2 did better than that, remarkably better than that. So why didn't that get pulled? And they just refused to answer. So wow. you tell me what happened. Um, and then of course I get strung up on the cross and then it becomes, if you're, if you're somebody who doesn't like the hatchet movies, it was a publicity stunt and the movie was a huge financial failure. If you like the hatchet movies, the MPAA did this. And I mean, it was just so heated and all of my representation, like that's the other thing that happens. The more success you have, you have these people, I don't know what they do, but like, Mm. it's like four lawyers and two managers and like, I don't know what they do. Um, and they're like, do not say a word. You're only going to make it worse. Just be quiet. And I had to sit there and take it and watch my movie get assassinated. But the comeuppance was that when it came out on DVD, this movie that nobody wanted to see, it sold off the shelves so fast that it was selling out of like Best Buy and Target within an hour of the release. Nobody could keep it in stock. What, was and, it um, that was still Anchor Bay, right? Wasn't it one of their highest sellers ever? Hatchet One is the highest seller ever for uh anchor bay actually that's not true frozen another movie i made has now beat hatchet um wow. since then but uh hatchet 2 was put out by a company called dark sky oh okay, and okay, okay. we decided to to not go with anchor bay because of uh, other other things mainly their theatrical release of frozen which was sold something so we took their baby from them and went to dark sky um and uh the 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 movie sold so well, especially even internationally, that they greenlit a third one after just seven days of it being on DVD. So, like, that never happened. So it wow. was like, what do you mean the movie wasn't a success? It was a huge success. And like I said, now here I am in this hotel room in New Orleans getting ready to start Hatchet 3. So um, in the end, we won. In the end, uh, you know, people were saying to me at the time, they're like, I know this sucks now, but just think more people are hearing about this movie now because of it. So mm. try to try to try to see a bright side to this. But you can't you can't see the bright side when you're going through that. I yeah, mean, but- it, it was awful and so unnecessary. For anybody who's seen the unrated version of that movie, it is completely harmless. It's mm. so silly. And this one will be the same way. It will be even more violent than the other two, but <laughs> nothing nothing offensive. Nothing to, nobody's ever had a nightmare because of a hatchet movie. Yeah. You know? Um so, uh, so here we are continuing and I'd like to think that in the end we won, but what a, what a year 2010 was. Wow. Well, in, and I mean, there's so many different things you can learn from that. I mean, one is just there, that there is an audience for the old school horror. Yeah. I mean, and, and everybody understands it. Everybody understands that it's, it's a bunch of, it's not blood. It's something else that's spouting out, but you just laugh yeah. and like, uh, I don't know. Um, but that's what we that's what we need. Like I was saying before, when I got into this, it wasn't, you know, it, horror in the 2000s became like that game that little kids play in the sandbox of like what's grosser than gross, where they just mm-hmm. keep trying to outgross the other one. And that's all it was. It was like, oh, you know what would really make people uncomfortable if I sat and gave a woman paper cuts on her lip for 30 minutes and made people watch? I don't want to see that. Like, I don't want to be punished when I go to the theater. That's not scary. Mm-hmm. Sorry to the filmmakers who make that stuff. You think you're so badass. It's, sorry, that's not scary. Like, to me, a movie like Spiral or Frozen, that like, the movies I made that are, like, not gory at all, that's scary to me. Um, not not just, like, hurting somebody. And, and um, I, I don't know. I think um, the reason why Hatchet has been so successful is there's a lot of people that feel the same way I do, and they didn't get into horror to be disturbed and mean. Mm. It was fun, and the Hatchet movies are fun. That's that's all they are. It's just mindless, silly fun, yeah. and um, and I'm glad that it's caught this sort of beat with um, so many horror fans worldwide. I mean, whether you go to Japan or Germany or wherever it is. Um, it's, it's the same crowd and they love it the same way. And, um, it's, it's, it's been amazing to see. And when I get to travel and meet kids that have Victor Crowley tattooed on their arms or me, (laughs) my face tattooed on them or the hatchet army logo on their chest. Um, it's awesome because this movie, it, it will be timeless 20 years from now. I honestly believe that there will still be horror fans like new kids that are just getting into it. And, the Hatchet series is something that they will watch. Um, just just like 
all the the franchises that I grew up on. So um so I'm very grateful for that and I'm I'm excited and I don't know if we'll make more after this one. Um I you know, I, I try to take it day by day at this point. Like mm. I I knew what Hatchet Three would be when I made Hatchet Two, but right now I can honestly say I don't know what Hatchet Four would be and I think the ending of this one is uh is really gonna get people. So um uh, this this could be it. We'll see. Wow. And now how how is this one being released? We don't know that yet. Um, you know, we don't we don't start shooting until the May thirtieth, so mm-hmm. it's like a little less than two weeks that we start rolling. And um, I don't know. I mean, I'm hoping that what Dark Sky does, at least in America, is that they do like midnight screenings in New York and L.A. and like key cities, or maybe even travel it and mm-hmm. have like cast members and people there and make it an event and tour it from city to city. Um, and then go to on demand and, um, and DVD. But the problem with trying to like fully release it is they have to get that stupid rating. And what do you think mm-hmm. the MPAA is going to do this time? Do, do you think now they're going to be like, Oh, it's fine. When, if they were smart and they wanted to hurt the movie, they give it a PG 13 mm-hmm. because then all the fans are going to be like, I don't want to see it. That's how you kill a hatchet movie. Give it a PG 13 and nobody will see it. But they're not smart enough to figure that out. If they really wanted to hurt me, that's what you do. Mm. Be like, this is harmless, PG-13. Because then I'd be like, what? I got to go shoot more gore. Um, uh, but yeah, we're not going to – we're just not going to – we can't play nicely with them with this franchise. Every other movie I've done, my TV series, are never, no problem. Mm. This, for some reason, they hate it. So we're going to do unrated and do a, do a, some theatrical screenings in key places and then try to get it out to people as fast as we can. Hmm. Now, just, just to play the devil's advocate, I mean, what, what if you t- took the NC-17? I mean, it's so only adults could see it and, it and it's not in the newspapers, but there would still be people seeing it and word of mouth getting out? Yeah, but the target audience for this series couldn't, couldn't see it. So yeah. it's like, what's the point? Um, and it also affects you with retailers like Walmart and oh, Target. Right. And okay. it, the NC-17, it's like, it's like being called porn. And they have to fix that. There doesn't mm-hmm. need to be NC-17. Rated R, restricted, cannot get in without, an, without a parent. Done. Why does there have to be different levels of restricted? There's not different levels of G, mm-hmm. like, this is safe, but might bore the, the the hell out of you. This one's safe, but it might actually <laughs> they don't do that. Yeah. So why do we like it's and, and it all comes down to money and the studios and how they they pay the MPA. I mean, there's a great um, documentary called "This Film Has Not Yet Been Rated" by Kirby Dick, hmm. which I anybody who's interested in the subject matter, um, you can get it on Netflix. You can get it anywhere. I highly recommend you watch it. A little sensationalized on the fact that they hire like private detectives to figure out who the MPA are and stuff. And um, but but it's but it's real, and it, and it will show you just how corrupt this whole situation is. But my days of fighting with them are over. Um, I'm not directing this Hatchet movie. We're not going to bother dealing with them on this. We're just going to mm-hmm. do our thing and release it. And everything else that I'm working on, I mean, especially right now, like Holliston is a sitcom. I don't need to deal with them on that. And um, this other project that I have in the works called Killer Pizza that I'm doing with Chris Columbus and MGM, it's not a gore gore fest movie. It's a mm-hmm. PG-13 summer kid monster movie. So um, That sounds kind of I, fun, actually. Yeah, I'd say, you know, but that's, that's who I am. I mean, my favorite movie of all time is E.T. I love movies like Love Actually. I started as a stand-up comedian. I make a, I write, direct, and star in a sitcom. I don't, like, I'm not, I'm not the bad guy here. And um, I tried to make that case when I had the appeal. I was like, I understand what's going on here. I know you guys are under some serious pressure because of the torture porn thing, but you picked the wrong guy for your witch hunt. Like, Mm. you I'm not the right one for you to go after. I'm not the bad guy here, but it, they had already decided like we're going to get that guy. And that was it. Wow. Wow. Well, I do. Uh, we got to move a, a little more quickly here. And uh, I know I would love to talk about spiral grace and frozen um, spiral actually is pretty interesting. Cause I, I know Zachary Levi. Um, I used to do a podcast for Chuck and, uh, Oh, great. Uh, so I know he was involved in that movie, but uh, tell me about these three movies a little quickly. Cause we got to move on to Halston as well. Sure. Um, I made Spiral simultaneously with Hatchet. Um, Joel David Moore approached me as we were shooting Hatchet and showed me the script. And it was a very, very small movie that we made, mainly with our own money. 
And um, I jumped at that because it was a Hitchcockian psychodrama, and Hitchcock mm. is one of my heroes. It was nothing like Hatchet, and so I knew what Hatchet was going towards, and I'm like, if I can make this at the same time, it'll really help diversify me. Mm -hmm. um, and then Grace came about because when I was doing the festival circuit for Hatchet, um, I met this guy named Paul Solit, whose short film called Grace was winning all these awards, and I just loved him. I loved his idea. I loved his script, and um, which I, I hate saying this because it makes people think that they should start sending me their stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't send me your stuff. I don't want to see it. I'm not going to make it, so don't send it to me. Um, but uh, but Grace ended up going to Sundance, and it was just such a, a such an original, creepy, disturbing movie. Um, and then the very next year, I was back at Sundance again with with Frozen, um, which, in my opinion, is my favorite movie of all the movies I've made. I think mm -hmm. it's the one that really shows what I can do. Um, the Hatchet movies are purposely a very specific thing. Um, Spiral, I love, but it's not the type of movie I really want to make again. Um, but Frozen, that sort of true terror and suspense. It's not a horror movie. It's a terror movie. Uh -huh. um, really, really proud of that film. I, I love uh, Rex Reed quote frozen is a brilliantly conceived gut-wrenching horror film i was so paralyzed with terror by this movie that i chewed a whole pencil in half watching it <laughs> yeah that was a good one to get that day when the <laughs> sent me that one i was like yeah. we could use this right this is a good one yeah oh yeah. that is that is great and and a great seller too i mean you you said it broke records for uh, anchor bay Yes, it became it beat Hatchet as their their top seller. So um, it was on it was like the number one thriller on Netflix for like four or six weeks in, in a row, um, and then worldwide, it, like theatrically, I think it was in it was either Italy or Spain. It like cleaned up. I mean, it did really well. It's just unfortunately wow. in America we were with Anchor Bay, and they theatrical releases are not their cup of tea yet. Like mm. they basically what they they do is they put a movie on so many screens. Because it gets some reviews and it counts as a theatrical release, which ups the order for all the retailers for the DVD. But you don't see them doing commercials on NBC or, you know, billboards everywhere. And like they don't, they're very cautious about how much they actually spend. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. Like I love Anchor Bay, especially the people that I worked with there, like are some of my closest friends. Like they're a great company, especially for this genre. And if you're like a first time filmmaker, they're the type of place that will actually step up to the plate and release your film. Um, so I love Anchor Bay, but uh, Frozen, especially for all of us involved, when we premiered at Sundance and people were throwing up on themselves in the theater and fainting in the aisles. And that the reviews, is crazy. Like Rex Reed's review. And I mean, the reviews were so huge. And the fact that they still were like, yeah, we're just doing this release. And that was um that was pretty heartbreaking. Wow, wow. And moving on, you did another one with uh, Joel David Moore, Chillerama, and that sounds like a boatload of fun. Uh, Mel Brooks style. Tell me about that one. Yeah, it was it was supposed to be a boatload of fun. Uh, um, my short, The Diary of Anne Frankenstein. So Chillerama is an anthology. There were mm -hmm. four directors who each did a sort of film noir piece. So I did a nineteen nineteen thirties nineteen forties um sort of spoof of Frankenstein. It was um, where basically Hitler is trying to create the Frankenstein monster because he sees Dr. Frankenstein's journal from the Frank family, mm -hmm. who had shortened their name to Frank from Frankenstein because they were so humiliated by what their grandfather had done. And he builds this monster who ends up turning on him and killing all the Nazis. <laughs> and um, definitely one of the most fun things that I've ever made uh, – one of the most enjoyable shoots. It was at the time I was coming off of Hatchet Two, which was a horrible shoot. It was mm. Hatchet Two was so hard and so brutal. And everybody was so sick, and I kind of wanted a break at that point. Mm. But then Chillerama happened, and um, and that movie kind of saved me as a director. It made me realize I do still love this, and I do want to keep doing this constantly. Um, but Chillerama as a whole, when you have four directors doing four right, different right. movies. Um, you know, I like to be completely candid with you. It's my least favorite of all the movies that Aeriscope, my company, has put out. In mm -hmm. fact, in some ways, I consider it our first miss. Um, there's things about it that I love. Um, there's other things about it that I don't love. And if you look at the reviews, you'll see um, exactly Man. what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate because it should have been really fun. But when you got four different people and some of them, they get so egomaniacal, it just has to be this way and they won't change it and they won't budge. 
Um, and unfortunately, I feel like the movie as a whole suffered a little bit. That being said, um, it did extremely well, and um, people people enjoy it. And mm -hmm. um, again, worldwide traveling with it, it was uh, great to see the way people react to different movies and um, within within Chillerama. So it was a good time. It got I got to reunite with Joel, which is always mm -hmm. fun. And um, yeah, that's Chillerama. Cool. Well, now we get to talk about Holliston, which is actually um, something that was from your very, very first feature. Um, Coffee and Donuts became Holliston. How, tell me about that journey and how that happened. Well, Coffee and Donuts um, was that feature I spoke of earlier that I made for $400 back when I was working at Time Warner Cable um, and borrowing their equipment. And it was basically like an autobiography about my life, trying to get over my, my first love, which took me a, like a decade to ever come to terms with breaking up with her. Um, and it was a story about two guys with a lot of ambition that want to make it in the entertainment industry, but are stuck in the small town of Holliston, Massachusetts. And basically it was a romantic comedy and the movie won film festivals, got developed for television. Ultimately nothing happened with it, but in the time that it took to get the rights back, all of a sudden, you know, I'd made Hatchet and Spiral and all these things happened and now I had a name for myself. And one of the producers on Frozen was a guy named Peter Block, who ended up becoming the president of Fearnet. Wow. And he said, I, I didn't even know Fearnet was a channel. I thought it was a, a website. I didn't mm -hmm. realize they were really doing anything with the network. And he said, I got to figure out what my first original show is going to be. And I'd love to do something that not only with you, but something that you're in, because I really like the shorts that you and Joe Lynch have done together and just your personality when you do on camera stuff and hosting on television and whatever. And um, I was like, would you be willing to do a sitcom? And he's like, I would love to do a sitcom because that's the last thing anybody expects that I would do as my first show. Yeah, Everyone's yeah. going to expect the Tales from the Crypt or uh, X-Files. And so I basically approached him with the idea for Coffee and Donuts and then we completely redeveloped it from the ground up where it's still about two guys trying to make it, still about the guy getting over his ex-girlfriend, still set in Holliston, but a whole different mindset where now we got to play with the horror genre within it. And mm -hmm. so um, it's my most favorite of everything I've ever done. It's my most personal. I love it so much. I've never had a better time in my life on anything um, to get to make a show like that where you have such creative control, because remember on that show, um, the writer, the showrunner, the producer, the director, and the star, like that would never happen at another network. They would never give somebody that much leeway. Um, and my whole family that I've worked with for 14 years now, everybody from the features came, uh, all these actors, we had Seth Green, Kane Hodder, John Landis, like everybody came out to help me with this. And um um, and I'm so insanely proud of it. And, and just the fact that it got made, that there's a sitcom like this. And the thing is, we're not making fun of sitcoms with the mm. show. It is a sitcom. And, um, but then there was the fact that just like I always go through, we're on a new network. They don't, they, it's not like NBC where they're going to market the hell out of it. And you're going to have millions of people watching on the night you start. So we mm. kind of thought the show this season would have been like a tree falling in the woods and that nobody would really hear it. And then once it got to DVD, word of mouth would spread, but we were completely wrong. Like by our, mm -hmm. our second night, so many people were watching it. The reviews were so good. And like the cast would do these live chats on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't keep up. Like there were so many people watching the show and it was destroying on iTunes. It was doing so well. And um, by the morning after the second episode aired, we got a green light for a second season, which wow, that wow. doesn't happen that often in television. So wow, wow. I'm – in the process of writing that season now, we start shooting it August 6th. So I go right from the swamp here in Louisiana to the stage to do the sitcom. And um, I am basically with Hatchet 3, I write overnight um, on Holliston and then I go to set all day. I sleep about 45 minutes here or there. And I've been doing this. Um, I've been doing this, this schedule for a few years now at this point. So um, hopefully after this, um, I do plan to disappear for a little while and take a little break. <laughs> And maybe just do the TV show and um, just because I want to live to see my kids grow up and stuff. You know, like I, there, there is more important stuff than this. I And I have to stop. I mean, mm. like literally doctor's orders like this year. He's like, he's like, I'm not, this isn't an empty threat. Like you will die soon. <laughs> um, I, I just, I can't even like, literally I was like hallucinating from lack of sleep at one point or having like nervous breakdowns and crying about nothing. And like in the fetal position on my office floor, my wife's like, What's wrong? And I'm like, I don't know. I just haven't slept. I mean, it's it's like torture. 
but I love what I'm doing and I'm so lucky to get this chance. So I can't turn it down. It's like, mm. we're going to make another hatchet. Of course I want to be there. We're <laughs> making more house. And of course, like, how do you yeah. say no? So I'm, I, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining because I'm the luckiest, luckiest person alive. I mean, for everybody who wants to pursue this, the fact that I don't need to chase studio movies and mm -hmm. do remakes that I don't want to do just to get paid, um, that I have my own production company and I, I make my own things and have this wonderful audience that supports it and keeps us in business doing this, um, I'm, I, I'm speechless. And I don't know what I ever did to deserve it, but um, you know, everyone always says they love their fans. Like I love my fans, <laughs> um, which is why I go to such great lengths to be so accessible. And I write back to everybody on Twitter and I write back to them on Facebook and or, you know, the fan mail that actually comes to the office and mm -hmm. I write letters back. Um, I do whatever I can to give back because I really, really, really appreciate what everybody's done for me. Oh, by, by the way, what is your Twitter handle? Uh, my Twitter handle is at Adam underscore Fn Fn underscore Green, and I'm the only Adam Green who's verified on Twitter. So mm -hmm. if you look up Adam Green, you'll see a lot of them come up. There's a few imposters pretending to be me. There's Adam Green, the singer from the Moldy Peaches, um, but you will see definitely see uh, that I'm the one with the little blue check. So um, I'm easy to find. Very very cool. Well, we uh, we have, we're going a little long, but I'd love to get your advice. Just, just general tips. I mean, you you have carved a huge niche for yourself. I mean, you're you're part of the splat pack now, and uh, um, I mean, you're uh, you're you're developing in a whole bunch of different uh, areas. I mean, I mean, doing this teen thing coming up. Um, that's that's really really cool. Somebody right now who wanted to break in, wanted to be a filmmaker, or just wanted to get um, into television. What would your advice be? Um, my advice is to, well, I mean, you can do, you can do all the normal stuff of trying to get a PA job and working on sets and being around people and networking, which you have to do. That's networking. Networking is not writing to a celebrity on Facebook. Hmm. Uh, networking isn't handing your business card to somebody or going to a horror convention and handing your short film to somebody. That's annoying. That's not, that's not networking. Networking is Getting a job and being an active part of a production, whether it be a short film that you're working on for free or something else like a, a feature where you end up being a paid PA and making relationships and making friends and working with people and becoming part of that community and working your way up and mm -hmm. having people know you. Um, that's step one. Step two is right. There's a lot of people that want to direct because they have good ideas Everybody has good ideas. My grandmother has good ideas. My dog and my cat have awesome ideas. Doesn't mean that they should direct. So write those ideas out. And that way, when you have a script that is so good that, that somebody wants to actually make it, you have a chance to direct that because it's yours. You wrote it. Mm. Um, sitting there and waiting for the phone to ring for someone to be like, hey, I heard you have good ideas. Do you want to direct? Um, <laughs> like, that's not going to happen. Um, and then, um, you know, shoot. Shoot short films. And there's no excuse. You can do it with your, you know, your, your iPhone. Like, you can do it with anything. Um, come up with a really good concept that fits what you have for accessible to you for equipment. And put it on YouTube and send it to film festivals and see what happens. But here's where what I have to say becomes unpopular. Make it good. And that's the problem is so many people think I did. I made five short films. Well, were they good? And they, everyone thinks their own things are great. Hmm. Um, the more you do this, the more you realize like your first attempt at a script or whatever it is, it's not there yet. You got to work on it and develop that discipline, be able to identify why it's not that good. And remember that your audience, like with an independent movie, they don't care that you didn't have the budget of Transformers. The average person, they don't know budget. They don't know mm. that you only had 12 days to make your movie or whatever. They expect it to be just as good as anything else they're going to see. So make it just as good as, as anything else. Um, and challenge yourself and, and make good stuff. Because just because you finished a short film, that doesn't mean it's good. Um, send it to film festivals and, and, and then make another one and learn from what you did and make another one and another one and just keep fighting and fighting. And it's like that speech in Rocky. It's not how many times you can hit. It's how many times you can get yourself back up and, you know, get hit. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what this business is. It's getting hit. It's taking insults. It's taking criticism. It's having stalkers and haters and people telling, you, no, you got to just 
put on the blinders and not care about that and, and, and keep doing what you need to do and keep getting better. So work on sets, write, shoot. Um, might just sound like, oh, I've heard that advice before, but read between the lines and listen to how I said it and, um, and, and take that advice because that's what I did. And if I can do it, you can do it. Um, I believe me, I know that I am nothing that special. I'm just somebody who worked really, really hard to make these opportunities happen, and you can do that too. Mm, very cool. Very and cool. and I, I heard a quote once that you said, invest in people who want it as badly as you do. Um, t- talk about that a little bit. Well, when it comes time to hire your crew, um, and I've worked exclusively with a lot of the same people, um, my director of photography, the producers that I work with, my makeup effects guy, um, because we, we've become a family and we're a team. We're all happy in the positions we do. I'm not working with like a DP who secretly wants to be a director someday or be the writer or whatever. He wants to be a cinematographer. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, these are all people that they're my friends and they want this just as bad as I do. We have everything in common integ- integrally. And um, they, you know, that's who you want to work with. You don't want to work with people who are like, yeah, I don't know. I, I like movies. I'll try this. I'll do, they're not good enough for you. You want somebody who's like, I have to do this or I'm going to die. And I live and breathe this and I will do anything I can to make this project as good as it can possibly be. Those are the people that you want to surround yourself with. So um, just because somebody's like, yeah, well, we can get this guy to be, to work with us. He worked on whatever Blair Witch Project or some really successful movie you know, feel them out, make sure that like they believe in your project as much as you do and that they have as much at stake as you do. Um, which is really what I meant from that quote. Like Mm. really it starts with the people around you. Like me, like I couldn't do what I do without the team that I have around me, the the Sarah Alberts and the Will Barrett's and the Corey Neal's and like, you know, any movie of mine you watch, you see the same names and all those credits. Um, you know, we, we do these things together and I might be like the guy in the, the front leading the way or whatever, but that's just because that's my position. Hmm. Um, but it's it's all of us that do this. Very, very cool. Well, all of that is great advice, and I'm afraid we have come way over, and so uh, I think we have to probably call Sorry. it. But is there I tend any- to do that. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. Um, is there anything else that, uh, that you'd want to promote or, or, or well, say before we end up? The first season of Holliston is now available on iTunes. So if you don't get FearNet and you don't get FearNet on your on-demand section, no excuse. You can get it on iTunes. I know it's not in Canada yet. It's not in other countries, but it's coming. um, And it will be on DVD and Blu-ray probably September, October. And um, we should know dates soon for, for foreign countries. But remember, our first season, it was only six episodes. Hmm. So, um I try to not get involved, but I understand from the suits side of things, it behooves them to wait. And now that we know we have a second season to wait until that season is underway and mm-hmm. then go and sell it to foreign countries. Cause then they're selling two seasons and it doesn't matter that we only had six episodes. Cause our second season is going to have more episodes. So it's going to have 13, um, right? It's, it's something like that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I haven't been given the okay to talk about it, but it's not, something okay. like that. Um, <laughs> and, um, so yeah, so at that point, that's when they'll probably uh, start sealing all these deals for Ford. Every mm-hmm. other country has expressed interest and tried to make offers, but I understand why they need to protect their investment and, and wait a little bit. So um, in the meantime, it is on iTunes. It'll be on DVD and Blu-ray, and um, it, we're, we will get it to you. I mean, nobody wants it to be in Canada or Germany or Spain faster than I do. Mm-hmm. So believe me, the wait is killing me more than it's killing you. Um, but at least by the time you guys get it, second season is going to be right behind it. Cause in America, they have to wait a year. Wow. So, um, which is a long time. Yeah. Very, very cool. So Holliston on iTunes and follow Adam on Twitter. Yes. Um, well, great. I super appreciate you taking the time. I know, like I said, uh, late night last night, you're uh, in the heat in uh, Louisiana. Yes. And, uh, and so I really appreciate you taking this time and I'm sure everybody's going to love it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. I can usually tell the difference between when somebody's using a an effect in Photoshop and actually using a lens that creates blur or creates focus effects. So aesthetically, I think it's more pleasing to create it from a lens. 
and also creating it on site in camera. Um, it just it has a way of clarifying your vision and making the images stronger, I think, because you're creating exactly what you want at the time on site. So I like the Lens Baby products because they're they're different and you get to play with blur and focus in different ways that you, you can't with other types of lenses. I've enjoyed that a lot. And I enjoy the range of different optics that they provide because you can do so many different things with them and create different looks, have control over blur and focus in different ways. And these new lenses that are coming out I think are really exciting because they expand the potential for photographers and the arsenal that we have to work with to create the images that we dream of and want to make reality. I really love working with focus and being able to tilt and shift focus and the ability that gives me as part of my visual language to focus the, the viewer's attention on particular areas in an image. I also like the fact that I can control the blur and control its out of focus and I think blur and things out of focus are oftentimes just as beautiful as things that are in focus. So those are um, reasons that I use different lenses like lens babies or a tilt shift lens or a view camera for different series that I work on. I'm really excited about the Edge 80. I've been asking for this lens for a long time from Lens Baby because it's a way for me to work with a digital camera and create effects that I could only previously create with a 4x5 or a lens of that sort on bigger cameras. So we can create two different looks with the Edge 80. We can use it like a normal lens and just focus it parallel to the digital sensor, or we can tilt it and use that slice of focus within the image to uh, create blur or create focus on particular areas in the image. With a tiltable lens, we can tilt the lens around and so our focus plane also becomes tilted at an angle. And so that allows us to focus our attention on particular areas in the image, say for instance on the eyes or a piece of jewelry. Um, it also allows us to create blur and create really beautiful effects with blur that we couldn't if we were working uh, with a straight parallel lens. With the Edge 80 we have three controls for how we can control the focus. So first we can tilt the lens and shift that um, plane of focus at an angle. The second control we have is working with our aperture by adjusting the aperture to say f22, we'll have a much deeper depth of field at that angle. Or opening it wide to 2.8, we have a really shallow depth of field, a really beautiful blur coming off the edges of that focus plane. And then we can focus the focus ring and move the plane of focus in and out, or forward and backward within the image as well. When you're working with a tilt and shift lens, you have to be real careful about how you meter things and how you expose your image. Because as you tilt the lens, the meter in the camera doesn't read the, the light properly anymore. So I'll frequently shoot and then I'll check my histogram on my image in my LCD screen to be sure I have the proper exposure and then I'll shoot some more and test it again. It's also really important that you bracket your exposure and I also like to bracket my focus because it's sometimes it looks like something's in focus and you're just slightly out of focus. Alright, we're turning around to your right a little bit. Good. Using selective focus is a lot of fun and it gives us a lot more creative freedom in how we, we focus an image or blur out particular yeah, things or focus the viewer's attention on particular parts of the scene or the clothing or the jewelry or the accessories or the face. Perfect. Yeah, I like Lens Baby's products because they expand the, the possibilities for my imagery. So I have more tools to work yeah, with to create more interesting images and to create something a little different. I think the images speak for themselves. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web.